When swatches lie, all of your gauge and tension questions answered. Sometimes you're a good little knitter, you follow all of the official advice, you knit a swatch, you make your project, and it still doesn't quite turn out how you had hoped and planned for it to. This video is going to cover all of the recent questions I've been having surrounding swatching, tension and gauge, gathered from my recent swatching series. Welcome to The Crimson Stitchery, a video channel about making all things beautiful and useful. My name is Anushka and you can find relevant links for this video in the down bar here below on YouTube. When swatches lie, all of your gauge and tension questions answered. So after releasing the first three videos in my swatching series, covering why bother knit a swatch, how to knit a swatch flat, and how to knit a swatch in the round, I encouraged viewers to submit their queries and their questions and their problems and complaints in the comments so that we could collectively answer some of those very, very common issues. That's exactly what I'm gonna be doing in this video now. There were a lot of very similar questions that kept occurring and I've collated them and I've also brought along some of my real world examples to go through with you. Just before I get started, I want to reiterate that whilst I really, really do recommend swatching, like I went through in my Why Bother Knitting a Swatch video and crochet, it's just not an exact science. It's just not. People aren't machines, even machines fail and there are alterations, there are things that happen on the day, you know, there are fluctuations in temperature that causes machinery parts to expand and contract and that can affect the outcome of the product. Knitting and crochet is a live experience and a constant practice, literally practicing the skills that you have. And the most important thing overall is to have an awareness of your tendencies and your personal traits, your quirks if you like, and also just constantly stay focused on the fabric it is that you are creating. So without further ado, let's get to it. What do you do if you've swatched but you have a different tension to what's been recommended in the pattern? This is actually pretty common, especially if you are substituting yarns, and indeed I have a video all about yarn substitution if that's something that you'd like to explore further. I will say that you need to be aware that there might be some differences whether you have knit with the recommended yarn or actually if you haven't, if you are substituting and if you're completely going off piste as it were. The easiest thing to do is just to knit another swatch with a different needle size. If when you knit your first swatch and you take the measurement you have got fewer stitches than what was written in the pattern, your tension is measuring at fewer stitches, Fewer stitches means that you actually have knitted at a slightly looser tension because your stitches are larger than what was recommended in the pattern, therefore fewer of them are required to make up that measurement. So if your stitches are coming out a bit larger, a little bit looser, then knit another swatch with a smaller needle size, just go one size down, that's normally enough. If on the other hand you've got more stitches, per measurement, you know, whether that's 10 centimetres, 4 inches, or if that's something else according to your pat pattern. If you've got more stitches, that means that your tension is tighter, or, or possibly that you're working with a yarn that is very, very slightly thinner than what was recommended um, in the pattern. It can be very, very little micro differences that can amount to just one stitch. And so if your tension is tighter, then you've got more stitches crammed into that same area. You need to go with a larger needle size in order to just spread your stitches out a little bit more. Sometimes when you re-knit a swatch, it still isn't enough to make up the recommended tension. And definitely do not be afraid of going up or down more than one needle size, going up or down two or even three. If you've actually ended up changing three or even four needle sizes, it might feel a little, little bit unwieldy with the yarn that you're working with. And I'm just underscoring this now because I had a lot of questions saying something like, I've changed two needle sizes, three needle sizes, and it's still not working out. I don't know what to do. I'm just gonna give up. And the thing that you've got to remember is that knitting tension is very, very individual to the person knitting. And also, as I expressed before, at any given moment in time, to be honest with you. So, don't worry if your needle size, if your gauge is coming out different than what was written in the pattern because that just represents what the pattern writer was working with. You know, they've got, they've got one set of tools and they've made all of the calculations for that pattern 
based on their personal tension and gauge. Your mileage may vary, that is normal. I very, very rarely hit the recommended tension, even when I do use the recommended yarn. And so along the years, I've just stopped even being bothered about what needle size is recommended in the pattern. And in fact, when it comes to the, the patterns that I myself have been designing and writing, I've stopped ascribing a specific needle size to the pattern, I've just given a more descriptive and supportive commentary around the type of yarn used and the needles that might be typically used, but just really, really encouraging people to swatch, basically. So, as I was saying, if it's just getting a little bit unwieldy, you know, if your, your knitting just keeps coming out too loose and you've gone down two or three needle sizes and the knitting experience is getting really, really tight or the needles are, you know, too heavy or whatever because they're too big, then you, you could explore some other options, such as looking at the needle texture, the material that the needle is made out of. For instance, I myself do notice quite obviously that when I use wooden or bamboo needles, my knitting tension does loosen up, although I have read online that other people experience the opposite. So you just gotta figure that out for yourself. If it's still not quite working, then I would start to explore your actual physical manner of knitting to see if you can make some adjustments in your actual technique. So how you're wrapping the yarn around your hand, how you are, you know, flicking or twisting or um, picking the yarn when you're actually knitting, you know, the actual small actions and micro movements that you are doing in order to actually knit. I would actually explore some different ways of physically knitting and that will certainly have an impact on your tension. For example, when it comes to my own knitting experience, all those years ago, I've been knitting since I was a teenager, um, I found that once I started threading the yarn around my fingers and actually tensioning it over my index finger, I could get a really much more even and consistent tension overall, and I've been doing that ever since. So it takes a little bit of time to get used to because, you know, it's different types of muscle memory and things might look a little bit wonky at the beginning, but just persevere and explore. What do I do if my colour work tension is too tight? So thanks for asking this question. I myself am not a prolific colour work knitter. I am just a fan of solid colour things. I do do colour work every so often. And I've got to say that one of the reasons that I probably um, was a little bit put off doing colour work as a knitter um, is that me too, <laughs> my tension was so tight, it was kind of unbearable at the beginning and it just didn't come to me personally as naturally as stuff like cables and lace, which is, you know, my preferred, you know, exploration and texture. Even so, I do enjoy knitting colour work. And when it comes to the tension of colour work, a lot of the time the issues are to do with your floats. So the strands that you're holding behind the work, you know, of the, of the other colour yarn. So you've really got to explore keeping your floats as loose as possible. It's a delicate balance between having them loose and having them just too long and, and floppy with too much slack that then gets tangled up. So different actual stitch patterns can really, really impact the way that colour work, you know, works out, as well as different types of yarn. Um, I would recommend going with a two-ply woolen spun yarn, something like Jamieson's of Shetland. You know, there's a reason why Shetland knitting is so prolific in colour work because they've actually created, you know, the yarns of that region are designed for colour work, so it just works out. Whereas something like a slippery superwash merino or, you know, an alpaca or something like that, you know, it's just so slick that the yarns aren't kind of coming together so easily. So think about the yarn that you are using in your project, but also experiment with ways of catching and securing the floats. Um, I've even heard of people turning the work inside out and like knitting the colour work inside out so that you're trapping the floats on the outside rather than the inside of the project, but I'm not quite sure about that. So it's definitely worth doing a little bit of research um, and figuring it out and just maybe just making things up and experimenting and trying for yourself too. When should I recalculate a pattern? So this is actually something which on the surface of it might seem very, very complicated. And yes, it does involve maths. Um, <laughs> and to anyone who's having a little chill right now at the idea of maths, I sympathize because maths was always my weakest subject when I was at school. And to be honest with you, most of that was just psychological because I actually, you know, didn't do too badly overall. <laughs> but um, when it comes to knitting, the maths that is involved is actually pretty straightforward. It's just different types of division and multiplication and you can totally, totally figure it out with a calculator. You know, you don't even need any kind of special kind of formulas really um, overall. 
So when you need to recalculate a pattern is one of two reasons. The first reason could be that you just cannot get gauge in one way or another. You've tried loads and loads of stuff and it's just not working out. And the other reason is linked to the first one, but can also be separate, which is just that you really like the fabric that you've produced and you don't even care about how the gauge, you know, relates to the recommended tension on the pattern because you're just really happy with what you've got. And in both of these instances, if you're happy overall with the texture of the fabric, then yes, do make a decision and go ahead and recalculate. And I'm not going to get into it in great depth now, but if you are interested in hearing my personal take on it in more depth, then feel free to drop a comment down below and I'll think about putting together another video tutorial for this series. But anyway, when it comes to recalculating, you know, you essentially are figuring out exactly what the width of one of your stitches is, and then you're figuring out how many stitches you need to then cast on in order to get the desired width of your project, which should be written down in the pattern somewhere. You know, if it's a garment, maybe you're basing it, you know, off the different, you know, me uh, horizontal measurements in the garment or if it's a shawl or, or if it's a you know, hat or whatever, you're sort of figuring out your, how your tension is relating to the pattern and then you're adjusting the stitches accordingly. And um, if there are different stitch patterns that have certain multiples that need to be divided into, then you need to take that into account. When I'm recalculating the pattern, after I recalculate the cast on amount, like say it's a jumper, sometimes I realise that the new number of stitches that I need to cast on for my personal tension, my personal stitch gauge, sometimes it works out being very similar to another size in the pattern. And sometimes it's just one size up or down, but sometimes it can actually be, you know, somewhere quite far away from where I am. And I appreciate that this might be considered slightly easier for me because I'm at the lower end of the sizing range. And I just want to, you know, give a shout out to anybody who's on either end of the average sizing range. I appreciate that this, you know, kind of quick fix type of option might not always be um, so simple for you guys to execute. However, I just want to stress that there is no such thing as a standard body size it just doesn't exist. And I, that just the idea that we would all become like identikit paper dolls that would fit into one size naturally is just so bizarre to me because it's unrealistic and it's untrue. The reason that I think standard sizing and knitting kind of got away with being quite um, rigid for so long and limited is because knitting physically stretches, the fabric stretches in ways that, you know, woven garments and sewn garments cannot accommodate for in the same way um, but whatever size you are at certain point I do really recommend going in and researching about recalculating patterns um, and again it's just very basic mathematics and you know getting a healthy relationship with the tape measure and with your body size because it's your body no one else's and we all just need to enjoy being in our skin rant over <laughs> um but I just wanted to say that like the idea of recalculating and, you know, changing, altering, amending, adjusting patterns is not, uh, is not, you know, um, a last resort. A lot of the time it's a first resort and it's a fun, creative exercise and it's one that I myself do all the time. And it just really, really empowers you in your knitting to really take charge and, and make things that fit you well and that you really love and that work for your lifestyle. What do I actually do with a swatch? This question really made me giggle. It's from a long-term viewer <laughs> and commenter, so hello. And by the way, I'm obviously not naming anyone's names of the commenters in this video because I just don't want to embarrass anyone. Um, okay, what do I actually do with a swatch? So this is a really funny question because this person said that they always diligently knit a swatch, although they admitted that they sometimes knit as small a swatch as possible, whereas I re myself recommend knitting as big a swatch as possible, enormous. Um, and they said that, you know, they just took a quick cursory measurement and they sort of flung it around a bit and was like, oh yeah, that will do. And they weren't sure what actually to do with a swatch, which I thought was a really great point because the recommendation is generally, you know, knit it and, you know, explore the drape and the handle. And, and maybe sometimes that's, you know, much vaguer than people realise. But when it comes to knitting a swatch, I literally scrunch it about in my hands and I think about it. And when I'm exploring the handle of this fabric, it's not just once it's finished, but it's actually whilst I'm doing the knitting. So the reason I've got these two um, 
swatches here that I've knitted from exactly the same yarn and this lovely, lovely mottled, very dark charcoal grey. I think it's a natural grey, I believe so. Um, it's because this was a very interesting yarn. Um, it is woolen spun, um, I think it's three ply, very, very rounded texture. And I knit it according to the recommended needle sizes on the yarn label, which was between 3.5 and four millimeters. So I knit it in my four millimeter needle and it was just so stiff. I really wasn't enjoying the experience. The tension was so tight. It was making my wrist hurt and the fabric, it, it just felt it just felt too rigid and hard so I did that and then I thought okay let me knit another swatch and go up a size to 4.5 millimeters so I did that and as soon as I started working into the body of my swatch I could feel the difference immediately in that not only was the tension more relaxed because it was knitted much more loosely but it just felt like the fabric had room to breathe and subsequently the fabric had a lot more drape it's you know it had slightly less body than the, than the tighter swatch understandably but it's not wholly or you know see-through in any way at all and that's to do with the yarn composition being wool and spun it was just absolutely gorgeous, knitted at so much of a looser tension than was recommended by the manufacturers. In fact, um, I, I would even say that I, you know, would reclassify this yarn weight to be something completely different than what was recommended. And I knit it into this jumper, which has just been cast off this weekend. And I had to completely recalculate the whole pattern, but it worked out in my favor because as I was knitting at a loose attention, I could cast on way, way less stitches. So the whole thing just worked up much more quickly and it's a lovely, plump, robust sweater. So you just notice it in the hand and you will get it by just paying close attention. There will be some yarns where, you know, if you go up and down one needle size, you won't notice a huge amount of difference in the drape and texture. And there will be some other yarns where you, you might notice a micro difference, but you don't really care. You know, you're not married to the, to the differences between them. You don't really have a big opinion one way or another, at which point, you know, you just need to make a decision basically. But for some yarns, it does become much more dramatic than others. So overall, it's just worth sort of honing your senses, honing your senses of touch um, and of sight and Mm, of smell, <laughs> still smells of sheep. No, just joking. But yeah, just paying close attention to your knitting and what's sort of unfolding in front of you, in front of your hands. Do I need to block a swatch? Yes, you do. You need to treat the swatch in exactly the same way as you would treat your final project. And you need to take measurements before and after. So I blocked these gray swatches. Now here I've got some really interesting yarn um, that I'll be talking about on the channel soon but it's a super bulky hand spun single ply yarn. And I'm considering not wet blocking these because I'm afraid that they're gonna um, grow, they're gonna stretch out a lot more, which I'll get to in a moment. Or I might wet block one and steam block the other one, but either way, I'm gonna be taking a lot of measurements and making a lot of notes. But yes, you need to treat the finished swatch in exactly the same way as you would the final project. So if that's gonna involve water then you need to try it out first and note the difference because there can be some transformations you know that's why certain you know high-end expensive garments are marked dry clean only so that the fibers don't ever come into contact with water sometimes there's no transformation at all sometimes it's really dramatic so on that note what about yarn that grows or what about yarn that shrinks you know there's a lot of mythology surrounding yarn growing circulating online in the knitting interwebs and some of it I find confusing some of it has been very off-putting to me you know like quite alarming some of it I just plain disagree with so something that you'll hear quite a lot is superwash yarn grows I knit a sweater in superwash yarn and it grew what does it mean that a yarn grows this is essentially referring to memory of the fabric. And this is something that I talked about before and also demonstrated in my video about whole super soft. And um, when we're talking about the memory, we're talking about the elasticity. So after it's been stretched out, how quickly and how well does it ping back together? 
And this is to do with the fibre um, and the composition and construction of the yarn. And it also is affected by the very stitch pattern. Essentially, the more twister that gets put into the knitting, whether via the yarn itself, you know, many plies, many, many twists, tight twists, um, or, you know, the, uh, the fabric that this created and also how the fabric is tensioned. Um, the more twists that are put into a yarn, the springier it's going to get, whilst some fibres are naturally very, very drapey. I just want to say right off the bat, I'm not trying to negate anyone's experience, but I myself have never experienced that superwash yarn has grown. Um, something about superwash yarn that I have noticed is that after I have blocked it, it tends not to keep its blocked shape. So if I've like, I've done a shawl where I've soaked it and pinned it out, wet blocked it and you know, very firmly in superwash yarn. And then after a couple of days, it went back to the slightly curvy wiggly shape of the shawl. As you can see, the top edge has got this bump and this curve and I had originally blocked it out to be completely flat and in a straight line and I knit this with a four ply weight and also I think four ply construction high twist superwash merino yarn and basically that yarn had so much memory that it only ever re remembered the original shape that it was on and it didn't want to allow me to manipulate its shape through blocking. I could have tried like using a lot more heat maybe pressing it with an iron and a damp cloth and sort of really setting it a little bit more but it's fine, I just accepted it by the by. So whilst I haven't experienced what others have when it comes to superwash yarn growing, I have experienced other things. And I t when it comes to the finished garment, I tend to think of it as stretching out rather than growing. I went through this when I did my sweater tours videos about a couple of items. This grey jumper, which is alpaca and silk, stretches out through the day and then shrinks up. And again, that's because the item is quite heavy. It's because of the fibres, they have a lot of drape and they just don't have a lot of memory something to bear in mind and also in slightly different manner this big super bulky jumper has stretched out rather a lot now I don't think about this as growing because I guess I'm not thinking of it in terms of the actual um, composition of the fabric changing through uh, water you know through the blocking but I'm thinking of it to do with the actual weight of the piece it's very very big and heavy and so throughout the day gravity has its effect and so it stretches out now this is not this is just something that I'm observing I'm not saying that there's like a technical difference between yarn stretching and yarn growing but this is just the way that I think of it and that helps me I have experienced yarn changing a lot from the swatch to the finished object and for me personally I've experienced that the most in shrinkage so I have that in this grey jumper um, where I did swatch several times but I think that I didn't measure accurately enough except basically when I blocked the swatch because this jumper this cardi, sorry, was originally, you know, down to my wrist bone. And when I wear it, it's a good two inches too short. So that yarn shrunk. That also happened very noticeably with Holst Super Soft, this jumper here that I made. Um, and I was very aware that that was going to happen in that case. And I do think of that one as shrinking um, because it is to do with the actual composition of the yarn sort of changing through through water as, as, as opposed to being stretched out through wear and tear through gravity and time. So they're sort of similar but slightly different concepts. What do I do if my tension changes and gets to tight. Now this is something that I've definitely experienced which is rummaged through my pile of sweaters here now. I experienced this on this jumper, the Christmas jumper, where the sleeves got too tight. And this is where the whole thing about paying attention to your knitting, to your project and to your style, your mood, your emotions really comes into play. Because most of the jumper is the same tension and it's the tension of my swatch, but when it comes to the sleeves, I was knitting in a very small circumference and my personal tension got tighter. I have read online that this is fairly common for a lot of people and that's why you might experience that sleeves are just way too tight. And it's just worth becoming aware of it. That's all, aware of your tendencies. So then when I knit another top-down jumper with sleeves in the round, this one here, 
I actually didn't follow, I mean, I had to recalculate all of the stitches for this pattern um, as it was, but I actually didn't follow any directions for the sleeves at all. I just did my own thing with my own measurements and knit really nicely fitting sleeves. So if this is something that you've realized does happen to you, you could go up a needle size and knit the sleeves on slightly bigger needles, or you could just cast on more stitches at the sleeves and knit slightly bigger sleeves. It, it's totally up to you. The opposite problem, I swatched, but my knitting is now turning out too big. This is something that often happens after we've been knitting the project for a little while and we relax. And it's most noticeable on things like mittens and gloves, where you might find that the second mitten is a little bit looser. And again, it's just worth paying attention to your tendencies. This might not happen to you, but it might do. And I noticed that it did happen to me on a pair of um, fingerless gloves. And it was a very, very small difference, but especially because this is a color work project, um, I did feel that it was a bit more loose and a bit more relaxed. So if this happens to you, you could try and block it out, but you might only get so far. You could try to go down um, a quarter of a needle size, you know, just go down to the next needle available. Or you could just simply accept that this is something that happens. Most of us have one side of our body that is slightly larger than the other side. Generally, our dominant side will have more developed muscles because we're just using it more. So you could make sure that you knit the glove for your dominant hand second so that you relax slightly and that the, the item is ever so slightly larger than the one for your non-dominant side. This is just something to think about and obviously you will make adjustments for your own individual project. That's everything from me today. I hope that you have found this helpful. If you've enjoyed this video, please do hit the like button down below and drop me a comment. Let me know if I've answered your questions or if there's anything that you'd like me to go into depth even more in a separate video, be very interested to hear. And this video was made possible thanks to all of my lovely and amazing supporters of this channel through Patreon. Patreon subscribers are helping me continue to make videos that people have requested so that I can create resources for the knitting community online as a whole. In return, you receive exclusive benefits. So do head over to patreon.com forward slash the Crimson Stitchery to choose the right tier for you if this is something that interests you. And do subscribe if you haven't done so already. Thanks so much. Happy knitting.